Hello everyone, this is General Hand Grenade. Welcome to my war room in Prince George, British Columbia. This is another episode in my series, How to Play Global War 1936 to 1945. In this episode, we will be discussing um, the political situation. So the relationship between the major powers, the relationship that they have with their minor powers. Uh, we're gonna talk about neutrality and alignment and, and, and control. Uh, so that you can see the, the difference between those, uh, uh, well, especially between alignment and control. T it took me a little bit to wrap my head around that one uh, because uh, they're, they're slightly different, but they're important differences. So if you're looking through the rule book uh, where you're going to find this section on what we're talking about, it would be page 19. And here I'll show you, this is the first page on that. It's, uh, it's called National Relations, okay? So... Before I get into that, let's just take a quick look at the board. So what I've done here, um, I've, uh, I, uh, I set up uh, just the neutrals on here because a lot of the discussion today is going to revolve around the neutrals. So I, I set up all the neutral armies on the board um, because uh, the, one of the things I like about this game is that the relationship with all of the neutral armies is complicated. You know, there's not just one way that, that uh, they relate to the powers or or even three ways like they do in, in global 40 there's several ways and it depends on who it is uh who the minor power is and and who the major power is that 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 is is relating to it right so anyway and i didn't put the major powers on the board because um it, it takes a long time to set this board up and I don't want all the pieces on the board for the videos that I'm going to make, but I thought it would be uh, helpful to set up the, the, the neutrals on the board or the minor powers as they're called, because uh, then you can see what they have and, and why it's important that you would or that you wouldn't uh, uh, align, uh, align these nations. Uh, like it's important to, to know uh, what is there. Uh, but with the major powers, of course, they, they've got, um, it depends on the setup that you're using, whether it's the 39 or, yeah, the 36 setup or the 39 setup. And I will be keying mostly on the 36 setup because the 39 setup is a very simplified version of the, the political situation in this game. So uh, what I've done instead of putting them on the board, like you can see here, there's the Eiffel Tower. So that's where France is. I just put the, the markers on the board to show where, where the capitals are for the major powers. And up here, there's the parliament buildings in, in uh, the UK. That's the capital of the, the UK and of the Commonwealth. Here's the Reichstag building. That's the capital of uh, Germany. Um, anyway, and so I've done that for all of them. And uh, so that's how this uh, the board's going to be set up. For this video, like here you use the, there's the Imperial Palace in Japan. Anyway, so what are the major powers and how do they relate to each other? Well, um, there's seven of them in the game, um, and uh, there there's three factions. So first of all, you have the Allies, and uh, that's the British Commonwealth. So that's what you see there is is uh, the UK. So it includes that, and it includes all these these uh, light brown territories. These are part of uh, the UK. There's some there, there, uh, and it includes the FEC, which is the Far East Command. Um, and here's they also have a capital, but they're actually um, uh, this is part of the Commonwealth. Like this isn't part of the the home country of the Commonwealth. It's uh, it's just uh, part. It's just one of the factions in the Commonwealth. Put it that way. And then uh, the other part of the Commonwealth is ANZAC, the Australian and New Zealand alliance here. So it includes New Zealand and Australia, all of Australia, and then a couple of islands up here as well. Um, and then they have a couple of controlled miners. So, uh, oh, and I forgot the Americans. <laughs> Can't forget them, can I? So then there's Washington up there. So that's uh, America. And America is on the other side of the board, of, uh, of course. So there it is there. And then there's Alaska. That's part of America. And there's a couple of islands out here that are part of America as well. Um, the Hawaiian Islands, the Wake. They even got one way down here in Guam and uh, here in the Philippines as well. So there's those. And then they, they control a couple of the miners. One of them is Abyssinia. 
and France controls this one here. And the other one is uh, Nationalist China. So there's three factions that are in China to begin the game. Um, there's the ones with the this roundel here. That is uh, the Nationalist uh, Chinese. And the American player is going to control the, all the territories that have that symbol on it. So they will they will spend their money for them and, and they will put units on for them. They'll roll the dice for them. Um, and there's also the Communist Chinese. They're part of the common term. Um, and uh, so they're they're controlled by the Russian player. And the other part of China is uh, just warlord nations. So they're kind of um, they're not they're not aligned to anybody really when the game begins. But um, as uh, they're taken over by either the communists or the nationalists, or they get attacked by Japan, and and they all become the once they get attacked by anybody in here gets attacked by Japan, then these. Uh, Warlords are going to join the nationalist Chinese, assuming that the communists haven't wiped them out at that point. So that's the allies. Um, the Axis are the traditional Axis that you think of in, in the game of Axis and Allies. So you have your Japanese here, and there's Tokyo with uh, the Imperial Palace on it. Um, Japan is like, this is their home country here. And they've got a bunch of islands as well, like you would expect. And they've got these territories up here. And this is the board as in um, 1936, as of 1936. So if you were starting in the 1939 scenario, it would be slightly different. You'd have to put a couple of roundels on um, for some of the, na the nations. And we're not going to get into that. It's just a simplified version of this. But this is the more complicated one. So I'm going to explain this one. Uh, so there's Japan. And then there's Italy here. Uh, so you can see this is their capital here, or Rome, and uh, this is their home territory or home home country here, uh, this peninsula here, and that includes Sicily. And they've got a couple of islands, and they've got uh, a couple of territories down here in Africa as well, and uh, and Germany. There's Germany up there. Um, they're they're actually only got uh, one, two, three, four, five territories. That's all Germany has there. Uh, but that's their home country, and then they don't have any satellite countries. But Germany is a lot smaller in this game than what you might be used to in some of the Axis and Allies games, because it, this is starting a lot earlier, right? This is before they started to expand. But um, uh, as far as the relationship to the neutrals goes in this game, Germany has by far the most complicated relationship with them. When I say complicated, I mean they have... Uh, a uh, 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 relationship where they can align neutral territories with no cost at all, but it has to be done under certain conditions, right? So anyway, that's the axis. And then the common turn, which is the third side in this game, it's a three-sided game. It's right there. It's Russia. And that's one big-ass territory up there. And um, controlled by Russia as well, like I mentioned earlier, is the communist Chinese and it's the Republicans. Oh, and I should have mentioned that the yellow guys here, that's the nationalist Spain, they're controlled by Germany. So when Germany takes their turn, they're also going to take the turn of the nationalist Sp Spanish. And uh, these are the Republican Spanish, the ones that you see in brown. Um, so they're controlled on the turn of the common turn. When Russian player takes their turn, they're going to take the turn of these guys and of the communist Chinese as well. And as I'm looking here, I noticed that I forgot to set up any communist Chinese. Uh, they only get, uh, I think, a couple of mountain infantry and a militia, though. So that's not a big deal that I forgot to set those up. Anyway, so uh, that's who the major powers are and their controlled miners. Um, so uh, the, when, you, when you have alliances, like uh, the, the, the allies that they have, uh, the America, or the United States, sorry, and uh, France and the UK, which is, has the rest of the Commonwealth, of course. And then, of course, you can include uh, nationalist China in, in that. Um, those uh, nations there, uh, if, you, if somebody comes and takes their territory, let's move over here for a second here. Like, let's say the Japanese came down and they took out Yunnan here. Um, when you take back a, a, a territory from, from somebody that's in your alliance, then 
like say the british came came and took it back they wouldn't put the british round along there what they would do is they would return it to the chinese so that would be uh, chinese territory again and that's the same with france or, or whoever like if uh if, if somebody came and took out uh, tunisia there then uh say the british came back and took it back well it doesn't become british it goes back to being french again not uh not uh, uh british so that's that's one thing that um, happens when you have a member of your alliance and you can tell who they are because of the roundel like here over here um i was mentioning abyssinia here is is a uh, part of the french here uh the french control these guys but that's not a french roundel so if uh, Italy takes this, which they probably will on the first turn, and then Britain comes and takes it, then it, it will become British. It won't become um, French because it doesn't have the French roundel on it. Like this one over here, French Somaliland has a French roundel on it. So that's the first thing. And, um, and the nations that are aligned to you in an, in an, in, um, to one another may also give permission for those nations to enter, move through, or fly over land zones they control, including the straits and canals and railroads. Um, they take the, defend together uh, when attacked in a land or sea zone, and minor powers that align become fully incorporated into the major power. So what that means is, like with me, um, I don't know how some other people do it, but like if, if uh, say Germany was to align Turkey, then I just take all of the Turkish units off the board and replace them with German units um, because the, the, they are for all intents and purposes German units now. They, they get their money, they get the, the territories, um, they get all the pieces that are in it and they can do whatever they want with those, right? Um, and uh, it's also interesting to note that, uh, well, let's just hear, um, but let's just start with aligning. Uh, I was going to get to it, but uh, I see on the second page we're going to get into that anyway. So aligning. Um, it says nations that are a member of the same alliance become aligned when they are at war with the same major power. So uh, when, uh, like, uh, the, there's the allies, but they're not really allies yet. Britain is not allied with France to start the game in 1936. They are in 1939, but in 1936, these guys are not aligned to each other yet. They will be eventually, and you can't you can't fudge that. You can't say, you know what? I don't feel like being part of the Allies. I want to be part of the Axis. You can't do that. It's you know you have to become part of the traditional alliances that that were in the, in back in in World War II. Um, so minor powers align to major powers under certain conditions, and we'll get into those. That's why I set up all the minor powers on the board. Uh, once minor powers are aligned, they become fully part of the major power and cease to exist as a separate country. And that's what I was just mentioning there with the Turkey example, right? Now, control is something different. Um, it refers to a limited level of decision-making that you have over a minor power that is not yet aligned to a major power. Uh, and uh, we'll discuss that in a second here, uh, and I'll give you an example, because that's, uh, it, it's a little more difficult. Um, but first, let's talk about neutrality. Uh, major powers are considered neutral until they are at war with another major power, even if they are at war with minor powers. So like I showed you in that example there with uh, uh, Britain and France, um, France could be at war with, with Greece or with Turkey or with Hungary if they want, um, but that doesn't mean they're at um, aligned to the British yet. They have to be uh, at war with uh, the same major power. So if Britain and France are at war with Germany, then they're aligned now, right? Um, but before that, they're neutral. So, uh, and, that, and the same with minor powers. The, this guy here, he's neutral right now. He's not at war with a major power, so that means that he is neutral. Um, it says minor powers are neutral until they are aligned to a major power who is at war with another major power, even if they are at war. So when I talk about France, if they were at war with these guys, they're still neutral until France is at war with Germany, then they become aligned with Germany. See what I mean? It's a little complicated, right? Uh, and then a major power may not enter or fly over a neutral nation without a declaration of war. 
Uh, so um, you can't fly over a neutral country. Let's put it that way. Um, if you're, say, the Russians up here, you couldn't fly over Turkey, right? You, you have to go around it. But here, like you look here, this is all neutral. So there's no way of getting around there. Plus, you can't fly over a neutral strait either. Or, or uh, sorry, a neutral canal. And this is a canal, not a strait. So you wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to fly through here either. Uh, basically, Russia could not... Uh, fly anywhere they, they couldn't come south this way because everything there is a neutral country They would have to declare war on somebody in order for them to be able to fly down there But you know luckily for them. They don't need to fly down there. There's nothing really down there for them to fly down for right um, But also that also means uh, major powers like these guys are all neutral when the game begins um, the, the, the British and, and the French uh, so the British would not be able to fly to the Mediterranean by going over France because these guys are neutral. Um, Britain's a neutral country and these guys are a neutral country in 1936. So you can't fly over them. You can only fly over uh, people that you're aligned to, right? Um, so let's talk about control for a second there and we'll talk about the difference between control and alignment. I'll try to explain it better now. Control is a limited decision-making authority a player has over a non-aligned neutral power. So um, uh, uh, when you control a miner, you may roll for its units in combat and select casualties. Um, also, you can uh, move its units inside their home country and at sea. Uh, and you can use their income and facilities for their own production. A controlled miner may not take any action that would put it at war with another nation. Um, you can you can uh, may gain control of a nation when a nation you are not at war with declares war on that nation, um, and then it changes to alignment if those uh, major powers go to war with each other. Okay, so uh, again we're going to talk about the Turkey example here. So uh, if Tur let let's say. Um, Russia comes down and they take out cars here. This is a territory. So they take out cars. So that means that uh, control over these other two territories are going to go to Germany. And so, uh, but Germany doesn't, like you wouldn't replace these guys with German guys. And you wouldn't put a German roundel on there because it's limited control. So Germany, um, they would roll the dice for these guys and like they could move these guys over here and you see they've got a little bit of money so you could take that three bucks and you could buy another dude and put him down here uh on on the um on the turn on germany's turn like when on the place units phase um you could move this boat if you wanted to like uh you you, you have control over their units there right uh but they're not yours you just have control over them um but what they can't do, like these guys could not move into, uh, like they couldn't go into Russia or they couldn't declare a war on Britain and, and start attacking Britain. And, hey, yeah, I got these, so I'm going to go down here and attack France. You can't do that. Like you'd have to stay in Turkey here, right? You can't, you can't go out and, and declare war on, on any other nation that, uh, that the, um, Germany is not at war with, right? <laughs> so that's control. Now, alignment is different. Major powers align with members of their alliance when they are at war with the same major power. And I talked about that with uh, Britain and France. Uh, once they're both at war with Germany, then they're aligned, right? A minor power will allow with a major power because it has been attacked. Um, and there's special examples of that um, on another page here. Um So with the Allies, for instance, the nations align with the Allies if the Axis declare war on them. Uh, nations come under Allied control if they are attacked by the Axis, but the attacking power is not at war with the Allies. So uh, the, the, the alignment is, like say the Germans want to go to war with um, Romania here, and, uh, and Great Britain, the UK, is at war with Germany. So what will happen is uh, once that happens, then these guys become part of the British because uh, the, the British are at war with Germany and, 
and Romania is not aligned to anybody. So once they, the, uh, Germany declares war on them, they become aligned to Great Britain. And there's a reason why they can become aligned to Great Britain, and, and I'll show you that in a bit here. Um, and, and then um, the opposite is true as well. Nations align with the Axis if the Allies or the USSR declare war on them. Um, and they're at war with a major power, right? So, um, let me just flip this over here, go to the next page. Um, and then the uh, common turn, that's the Russians. Whenever I say common turn, just, just think Russians. Uh, only certain nations align to the Russians if uh, any nation declares war on them. And basically it's two of them. Uh, there's Republican Spain, so if either the Allies or the Axis declare war on Republican Spain, then uh, then they align to the common term. And Mongolia, that's the only other one. So say Japan decides to attack Mongolia, then Mongolia will align with the Russians. And those are the only two. Um, now, when you're assigning alignment and control, like when you're deciding, okay, well, who takes control of these guys or who, who do they align with when they're attacked or when somebody declares war on them, that's pretty easy. Uh, over here in the Western Hemisphere, which basically means this part right here, right? Uh, South and Central America, that's the Western Hemisphere. And that is too, but uh, you don't need to worry about that. When somebody... Uh, um, uh, declares war on one of these and declaring war you can either do it verbally uh, or you can attack somebody that's the same as declaring war right so when somebody declares war on them uh, or sorry when when uh, uh, the axis declare war on them or the the common term then they align with the Americans uh, always said they don't ever align with anybody else they will align with the Americans uh, everybody but Argentina, I should have mentioned that. Yeah, so Argentina doesn't, okay? Uh, but everybody else does. I, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Okay, so then um, everybody else uh, in the game, um, if, as far as the allies go, if uh, the al if the, uh, the Axis declares war on any of the other minor powers here, then they will align with Britain. And that, that, that can be anybody. It could be Greece, it could be Turkey, and it, it could be, you know, and Norway, it could be anybody. They will all align with uh, the Commonwealth. Now, if uh, the Allies or the Comintern attack uh, a neutral nation, then they will all align, not all of them, sorry, any one of those nations that, that have been declared war on, they will align with Germany. Okay, not Italy, but Germany. And except for one, there's only one where that's not the case, and that is Siam here. Siam will align with Japan if it is attacked. Like say the British want to attack Siam, then that aligns with the, Brit or with the, with the Japanese. Every other neutral on the board, they're going to align with Germany. Okay, so um, so minor power will align with a major power because it is attacked. Um, once uh, aligned, a minor power and its units become part of the major power for all purposes and ceases to exist as a separate game or a separate country for game purposes. Uh, but that's with the exception of uh, of uh, China. Um, they they remain separate minor powers. Like if the Japanese attack uh, China, they're still separate. They, they don't become part of the Americans all of a sudden. Um, it's just uh, those are the only ones. So like I said, uh, if somebody attacks um, Turkey, then they become part of the other side. They're controlled by the other side. And if uh, if they're all of a sudden, uh, like uh, if it's Germany that attacks them, and then um, UK goes to war with Germany after that, then all of a sudden these guys will become aligned. So you'll take all those units off the board, you'll put the British roundels on, and you will put British units on there, including the boat. They will align with the other guys. So that's, uh, that's the difference between alignment and control, and that's what neutrality is. Um, now, there's also special alignment uh, conditions, 
And so for the Allies, you see Poland there, that's that, that's the green guys up there, right? All of those green guys up there. So uh, what happens with Poland is that they will align with Britain on the turn that Britain and France are at war with Germany. Um, that's if Poland's not uh, conquered uh, by the time the British term comes along, because Germany is going to go up before that and Russia is going to go. So if they wipe out Poland and there's nothing to take control of, right? Or sorry, nothing to align anymore. They will be part of Germany or Russia or both. But if there's any part of Poland left after uh, after Britain and France go up to war with Germany, then they become part of the British. And in the 1939 scenario, Poland already begins, begins aligned with Britain. So all of the stuff that's on here in the 1939 scenario would be British. Uh, you might as well even just set British units up there. You add the, the income to the British as well. And I just knocked that guy over. He must be drunk. Uh, so the Pan-American nations there, you can align them. Uh, those are the ones that I showed you over here in the Western Hemisphere. The Americans can align those ones if they want. Except for, like I said, except for this one. Um... Uh, the, the blue guys here that there's three territories here and that's Argentina so the Americans can align any one of those ones there um, once uh, once they're at war with another major power like they couldn't do it in 1936 they have to wait until whatever year it is it could be 1941 or 42 you know whenever they they go to war with uh, either Japan or China or sorry no Japan or Germany or uh, Italy, or I guess uh, Russia, if they go to war with them because they're a major power, then they can attempt to align these nations. And how that will work is that um, they will say, okay, I want to align with somebody, and they will pay up to three bucks. So let's say they want to align this one here. They'll pay three bucks, and uh, or two, or one, and whatever amount of money they pay, they have to roll that or less. So if they pay three, then they got to roll a three or less. And if they do roll a three or less, then all of this stuff here becomes American and they will get the money for it as well. They can add these to their income. And if they don't get it, then they, then, you know, oh well, they, they missed it. Um, now you can add one to that if uh, there's an enemy submarine hunting along uh, the Rio de Janeiro convoy line. And that's this convoy line here, the, the white one. You can see it goes up from here and it goes all the way up to New York there. So if, uh, if uh, since the last American turn, if uh, say a German sub was, uh, was uh, attacking the, the convoy line there, then you can add one to that. So if the Americans paid three to align this, then they can do it at a four or less, right? And that goes true with all the nations except for Argentina, they can't align them, but they could try to align Mexico if they wanted, like Mexico has a fighter and it's got a destroyer there, you know? Uh, they would add their their income to to theirs and, and everything. Otherwise, these guys down here, nothing ever happens with those guys down there, right? Um, except for there is a, a stipulation for Argentina there, and that's the blue guys that I showed you. And they kind of had a special relationship with Germany, and it was it was kind of complicated. Like some people thought that that Hitler, you know, after the war, he didn't really die. He went to Argentina. And there was a lot, like, um, I don't know if you've ever seen the show, Nazi Hunters, but a lot of them they find down here in Argentina. So they they, they, they had uh, friends in Argentina, put it that way. I don't think it was ever official, though, like the, the government of Argentina. But uh, there was a, they had a lot of sympathy down there yeah, and a lot of support in Argentina. So Germany can align Argentina once Germany is at war with at least one major power. Germany must pay two IPP to the bank and roll a D12. On a one to one or two, Argentina becomes Axis aligned. Uh, and the, if that happens, then you increase the US income by one D12. So you'd roll a D12 and the Americans, uh, you would change their, their income level. Uh, it would go up by whatever that number was. So that's uh, that's the only one down here that can align with anybody other than the Americans. And that's, uh, uh, and then there's a whole bunch of other ones like here, Siam. 
1939, in July of 1939, they will automatically align to the Japanese if they're still neutral. Like if Britain has taken them out or China has taken them out, then they won't. Um, but they will align to J Japan just automatically. So you would add a dollar to the Japanese. You put a Japanese run along, you, you change these units here to Japanese units and, and then you continue the game, right? Um, so let's talk about uh, some of the axis. And th th there's a, a bigger list of those. You know what, I'm gonna go to the other side of the board, okay? Um, and uh, I'm gonna take this stuff with me. So Germany, like I said, they're the ones with the, that are most complicated. Um, they have more alignment conditions than anybody else, or, or ways that they can align miners. So uh, the first one is they can annex uh, Austria, Sudetenland, and Slovakia. So that's, let me just pick this guy up here, sober him up a bit, get some coffee into him. Okay. So what I did was I, when I, when I, when I painted all my, my um, minor powers, I, I made sure that all of these ones were white here. And they could have been any color, I could have picked any color, but I, you know, like I painted the first one white, so the rest one, rest of them I painted white. And that's because all of these have a special alignment conditions that, that uh, the Germans, uh, and, and it's just a matter of Germany wanting them. <laughs> like if you played uh, um, Global 40, you'll know, like all this stuff here w w was part of Germany, right? Uh, during the game. Uh, at the start of the game in 1940, and that's basically the the point that you get to in this game as well. All this stuff will become German, right? Uh, so that's this territory here, Sudetenland, Slovakia, and Austria over here. Now they can annex them one at a time, starting in 1936. So, like I would probably axis Austria first because it's worth two I IPP. Uh, so if you can only do one at a time, you might as well get the most money that you can right away. So you annex these guys. And what you would do is you would move one land unit into there. And then uh, next turn you move the land unit up to here. And then the next turn you move the land unit down to here. Um, and there is a, a, a special rule that you can use. It's uh, I haven't used it, but um, uh, where France and I think the UK can interdict when you're trying to do this one. But it, it doesn't work out well for them if it doesn't work. So uh, it's probably best just to let Germany go ahead and, and annex them. Um, they're not declarations of war, but they do trigger incomes uh, increases in the Allied powers. So everything that you do in this game um, isn't necessarily what it looks like, right? Like uh, you go to annex Austria. I think what it is is uh, France and Britain each go up by a dollar on their income. Um, and, and the next one, then it'll go up another dollar, and the next one, another dollar. Like it, everything has its own certain conditions when, when it happens, right? So those are the first three, is these three right here. And they, they can get them just by moving in, and that's when they're not at war with anybody. Now, Bulgaria, or Hungary, and Romania, so there's Hungary. Uh, there's Bulgaria and there's Romania. Those are the other three white ones that I have here, or with the white units, I mean. Um, they will be available for alignment immediately after Paris falls. So Germany, in the place units phase of each turn subsequent to the fall of Paris, may align one of these three nations. As soon as Germany declares war on the USSR, the remaining nations automatically align. So if you if Germany declares war on on Russia and they haven't aligned these three nations yet, then they will automatically align to Germany. Like I said, <laughs> you know they eventually get there by 1940 or so, right? Um, but what happens if like if Germany decided they wanted these guys earlier, you know, uh, like uh, they're they're not at war with with uh, or they have Paris hasn't fallen yet and they decide to go after Romania, then they're going to have to attack all these guys in here, right? Uh, and they're going to take some losses probably, and then these guys will all be dead afterwards. Whereas if they just wait for the appropriate amount of time, then they can just move in there and then all of these guys here, including this boat over here, will become German. So the game kind of pushes you into uh, um, do this, now go ahead and do this, now do this, you know what I mean? But um, at the same time, if you if you annex Romania or sorry if you align Romania, 
then um, Russia is going to get, I think it's a, uh, you roll a D12 uh, to, to add to the Russian income because anything on the Russian border here that is, is uh, Axis controlled or controlled by the Allies for that matter, um, those, those nations that you control like that, that's going to uh, trigger a, a big increase if, if, the, if, uh, if you get any of these nations, right? So that's the last one you wanted to. Now these ones, uh, I was reading through it and it didn't seem that you had to move a unit in there. It's just in the place units phase, um, subsequent to the fall of Paris, it may align any one of these three nations. So I guess you just say, okay, I want this one. And then you replace those dues with German dues, right? And you put a roundel on there and you get their money. And the same with Hungary. And then when you're ready to attack Russia, um, either do this just the turn before or do it that turn, you know, to, to avoid giving Russia that big increase. And again, like I talked about earlier with these other three, that's going to trigger increases in the other nations as well. Uh, some of the other nations. And um, I'm not going to tell you exactly how much and who and, you know, and same with China. Like when, when Japan attacks China, then I think the Americans get a $5 increase and the FEC gets an increase and the ANZAC get an increase. Like it, it triggers a series of things when, when uh, minor powers get attacked. So that is Bulgaria, Hungary, uh, Hungary and Romania. And that, that, that's all the white uh, units that I have here. Now, Finland up here, that's these blue guys up here. Um, this blue, uh, and there's a boat there as well. Germany and US USSR have the option of a special call pack called the Molotov Ribbentrop Pack. And that was the name of two different guys who, who, who negotiated this thing. One was called Molotov and the other was called Ribbentrop. That's why it's called that. Um, if they sign the pact, there are special considerations for Finnish alignment. If the pact is not being signed, Finland aligns normally. Um, uh, yeah, Finland would just align normally, like I talked about earlier where, you know, somebody attacks them and then they're at war with a major power and then they align to the other guys. So, but there, there is a way um, for uh, Germany and the USSR to divvy this up. And they would, it also includes divvying up Poland. But you know what, it's such a, uh, a big agreement and there's a, a number of things that I'm not going to talk about the whole thing right now, okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a separate video on the molotov ribbentrop pack so that uh, you can better understand that, so that I can better understand it, because I didn't use it when in the one game that I played, um, and uh, we will we will discover it together. Okay, uh, okay, nationalist Spain. So that's the the yellow people down here in in, uh, in Spain. Okay, so nationalist Spain. If nationalist Spain has won the civil war, it will align with Germany at the end of combat phase if the Axis have possession of either London or both Gibraltar and the Suez Canal. So uh, they will align with Germany if they won the Civil War, and then Germany takes out uh, London, or the Axis powers take out Gibraltar and um, the Suez Canal, so they'd have to own Cairo, right? So that will make the, the Spanish, or yeah, the, the Spanish nationalists align to the Germans. Um, if the Spanish War is not complete, then the nationalist Spain will align with Germany when Germany and USSR are at war. Spain begins nationalist in all 30, in all 1939 and later scenarios. So if you're playing a 1939 scenario, you're not going to have two different color of the units here. This will all be nationalist Spain, and it will be a different setup as well, uh, like uh, the, in the setup cards there. Uh, there's three different uh, things. One is for this and this, or sorry, one is for this, one is for this, and the other is for if it's just, uh, um, if, if it, it's going to be all nationalists. So uh, if this fight isn't over, and I didn't do that right in my game either, if this fight isn't over, then these guys become German and these guys become Russian. And you just keep going like that, like you would add that to their income. Uh, there's not much money in those territories down there, but there's some units and everything, and... I think that Germany would have an advantage there because Germany is already probably down here, right? And the Russians are a long ways away and they're on the other side of Europe over here. So that would be a bonus for 
probably for Germany because then Germany could just go in there and, and help out and take all of Spain, right? So Turkey, that's another special case for the Germans. Turkey, 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 <laughs> Turkey will align with Germany um, at the end of combat phase if Germany has possession of Transcaucasia. And this did happen in my game. What I did was I took uh, a, uh, a transport plane with an airborne unit and I took out Transcaucasia. And so at the end of the combat um, movement, or at the end of the combat phase, all of Turkey here became part of the Germans. So all Germany has to do is take out Transcaucasia and at the end of their turn, they will get Turkey. They don't have to go and take out all of these Turkish guys. All they have to do is take Transcaucasia from the Russians. Um, Iraq. Iraq will align with Germany or Italy at the end of any combat phase if there is a German or Italian land unit in any land zone adjacent to Iraq. So this is Iraq right here, uh, this space right here. So all uh, Italy or Germany has to do is take one space anywhere, anything that borders Iraq. If they, if they take that space, then this automatically becomes German or Italian, depending on who took that space, right? So the Italians could come down here and and, um, and take Transjordan if they want. That will automatically give them Iraq, right? And Sweden. Sweden will align with uh, Germany at the end of combat phase if the USSR declares war on neutral Norway or Denmark. So if uh, Norway here, that's uh, these red guys here, if uh, the, the Russians decide they want to go in there to take out that money, then Sweden here will align with the Germans. Or if, um, if uh, the Russians decide to take out Denmark, and that's while Denmark is still neutral. Like the Germans can go in there and take out Denmark, and then if uh, the Russians decided to take Denmark from the Germans, that's not going to trigger Sweden because it says neutral Denmark or neutral Norway. So if Germany had already taken Norway, then that's not neutral Norway, right? So it's only if Norway is neutral and, or Denmark is neutral, and then the the Russians take it, or yeah, yeah, Russians take it if it was neutral. And um, what you see here, like I'll mention that now, but uh, I could have earlier, what you see here with the setup, with the opening setup, the, some of these, actually many of these uh, neutrals increase in strength. Uh, like by the time uh, the game ends, there's a ton of shit here on Sweden. Like the, you, you just keep adding, okay, it's like in July 1942, add this. Okay, in uh, January 1943, add this. So Sweden, you know, like that, they you add units to them, you add units to Romania, but some of them are on the condition, like if it's still neutral, and add this. So that's another reason not to, you know, take one of these things uh, at a at a certain period of time. If you just wait one more turn, then it might get a free unit, and then you take it, right? Then you align it. Uh, it's it's pretty complicated, isn't it? <laughs> you you, you kind of got to read everything, and it's not just here. Like I'm I'm reading right now. I'm reading from this page here. Uh, this is page 22. So you know, like these are the alignment conditions, and I'm going through these green ones here. But uh, that's not the only one. Like you have to read each and every card here. Like there's the German ones here. This is where you find the Austrian Sudetenland and Slovakia annexation. Um, and uh, like each card has things on them. You know, like people will get a uh, bonus of this uh, if this happens. Like here, let's, let's take a look at this uh, this uh, German card here. So wartime bonus income. If Sweden is neutral or Axis possessed um, aligned. Um, so if Sweden is neutral and Germany's at war, like it is neutral right now, then Germany gets an extra three bucks. So you would add three to the income tracker up there just because Sweden is, is still neutral. Uh, it says if Narvik is Axis possessed or aligned, plus one. If Spanish nationalists won the Civil War, then they're plus one. If Romania is Axis possessed or aligned, then you add three. So not only would you get three bucks uh, for the Germans um, for owning this, 
because this is worth three, but you would get a bonus three dollars because that's just a wartime bonus, right? Um, and then the Molotov Ribbentrop pack, and like I said, we'll do a video on that later. There's, uh, they all get an extra five if if they've signed that pact. Uh, and but all of the cards are like that. Like uh, the British card uh, has a lot of stuff on it, and you'll find like the the Anzac card doesn't have a much, but um, the major powers, uh, most of them, there's all kinds of bonus income, and it's not just for uh, when they're at war. It's when they're at peace, uh, and and you'll find with the the allies. Uh, let, let's just go grab one of their cards. With the allies, when they're at peace, that's when a lot of their bonuses kick in. So here, let me just uh, set this down and grab a card for them. Um, so here's the United States card. Let's just take it over and take a look at this. So the peacetime bonus income here. Let's just take a look here. Uh, Japan completes a battleship, aircraft carrier, or light carrier. So when I say complete, I mean, that means that they, they put them on the board because uh, there's that, uh, the production and facility chart that I showed you when they start buying one, that I mean, doesn't mean they get to put it on the board. That means they got to keep paying for it for a while. It's, it's, on the, it's on the mortgage plan, right? But when they put it on the board, America's going to get three bucks for every uh, battleship, aircraft carrier, or light carrier to put on the board. Uh, Japan declares war on the USSR other than border skirmishes. So they're allowed to skirmish at the border uh, and not take over each other's land. They're just like hucking grenades at each other. Then uh, the Americans will roll a D6 and whatever number it is, that's how much the American money goes up. J uh, Japan declares war on any neutral. Uh, the Americans get two D12. So, you know, like if they wanted to declare war on, um, on Mongolia, for instance, then the Americans are, so it's not worth it. Like Mongolia is only worth two bucks, right? Why would they do that to give the Americans two rolls uh, with a 12-sided dice to add to their income? Uh, Japan declares war on Great Britain or France. America, or, uh, yeah, America gets to roll five D12. Uh, Germany is at war with Britain or France. America gets five bucks. Axis possess London. Americans get 25 bucks. Mm -hmm. Germany declares war on USSR. So you roll one D D12 uh, when Germany and Russia go to war. And Italy declares war on Great Britain or France, then the Americans are going to get five bucks. And that's just when they're at peace. And that's a big deal because you look at the starting money here. Uh, Americans start with six bucks. They have to get to $63 before they can declare war on somebody. Like they, they can't do anything. They can't go to war with anybody. They have to stay in America and their boats have to stay uh, along the coast there on both sides on the coast until they are at war with somebody uh, and so uh, if nobody declares war on them then they have to wait until they ha keep uh, getting mm -hmm. these bonuses down here until they get to 63 bucks and it's uh, I think it's in 39 um, uh, that they start uh, yeah starting in July 39 they roll 1d12 per turn until reaching their wartime income so uh, it uh, <laughs> <laughs> like a, you can roll the dice and only get a one on it though you know you might get a 12 but you might get a one like it might take forever it took me till 1943 to bring the americans into the war in the game that i played uh and so when you're when you're thinking about neutrals and you're thinking about taking over neutrals declaring war on them and things like that those are the kind of things that you're going to come up against as the access player is you're going to give money to the other guys right and, I'll, and I showed you the wartime bonus income for the Germans here. There's only one for the Americans. Like here, the wartime bonus income, that's in green down here, for control of uh, the contiguous USA. So that's uh, the 48 lower states. They get an extra 12 bucks for that. So they would be at 63 probably, plus 12, so 75 bucks. And what that means is that the lower states here. So those, those states there and the states over here. So it doesn't include any islands. It doesn't include Hawaii. You know, it just if they if they control all of those states, then they get an extra twelve bucks when they're at war, but not when they're at peace, right? Um, another thing we should mention is the Monroe Doctrine. So the U.S. the USA can declare war on any major power that declares war on or attacks any zone in the Western Hemisphere. So that's anybody. Like it could be Canada up there. Could be America, obviously. And then it could be any of these nations down here. 
Uh, that doesn't include Argentina aligning this uh, because they're not declaring war on them. But if the Germans came down here and decided to attack somebody or the Italians or the Japanese, that brings America into the war. Uh, that was called the Monroe Doctrine. The Americans just would not tolerate anybody attacking anywhere in North, Central or South America. That was their line in the sand uh, back in 1930s and 40s was, hey, you, you want to be at war, you go, play, you go play war over there. You bring the war over here, then, then we're jumping in, right? Um, and other things that happens, uh, like when I said Americans uh, start at 6, so like the Panama Canal here, and I mentioned this when I talked about canals and uh, straits. Like uh, anybody can pass through this canal here that they want until America reaches an income of 15 IPP, then America can decide who goes through there or not. So they can say, no, Japan, you can't come through. And then, you know, that, that uh, Japan's either going to have to go away or declare war on the Americans, right? And if the Americans are only at 15 IPP, then I don't know, uh, maybe you played the game before, maybe that's a good idea. It doesn't seem like it to me. It seems like you should leave the Americans out of the war for most of the game and, and keep that income and, and those troops off of uh, off of your land, right? Because the Americans want to enter the war, just like in World War II, they were very powerful. They got a big income and uh, once they enter the war, then things change drastically. But uh, that's, that's uh, for that canal there. Uh, when they hit 35, IPP, the USA may force, reinforce Pacific Islands. Oh, I didn't realize that one. Okay, so once they once they re, um, get to 35, then they can bring stuff out to Hawaii and, and to the other islands, right? Mm -hmm. um, the U.S. Pacific Fleet may move to Hawaii. Uh, the U.S. ships may perform escort duty for convoy lines in the Atlantic Ocean. So those are... Uh, there's uh, the convoy lines, like I showed you the one convoy line, but there's other convoy lines over there. So the USA can go jump on those convoy lines there with their escorts. And we'll get into that when we talk about convoy rating. Um, the USA can start uh, escorts at that point. And when they're at 50, the US and Germany may engage in naval combat within two zones of the US coast. So the US can actually attack uh, Germans if they get within two, uh, two zones of the American coast. Um, but I don't think that's going to bring them at war either, right? And then at 63, that's when they can declare uh, war on any minor power and certain major powers. Uh, and they may move ships between the Atlantic and Pacific. So, um, so I don't think they can move their ships through the canal until they're at war. Like the Panama Canal down there. That's the first I've seen that. So that could be. But... Um, Another thing that I, I didn't mention, so when it comes to minor powers, uh, the, these are all the ones that you see on the board here, right? Except for Spain and, and China, of course. But um, with the minor powers here, uh, the Axis powers can declare war on them at any time. Any one of the Axis powers can, can declare war. So, for instance, uh, Italy, they can declare war on Romania. They're right next door and they can go and attack them. But that's going to uh, that's going to trigger something, right? In this case, with Italy, if Italy attacks any mount, minor power other than uh, this one down here, because they were at war with Abyssinia before the game began, if they attack Abyssinia, then that doesn't do anything uh, as far as relations go. And they also are allowed to annex Albania, so for free they can just go over there and jump on Albania. Although I don't know why, because Albania is not worth anything, but. Any of the other minor powers that they, that they attack, that means that, that uh, the British can declare war on them. Uh, otherwise, Italy can skate through this whole game, not being at war with anybody, as long as they just <laughs> stay there and keep their nose clean, right? Attack Abyssinia and don't attack anybody else. So, uh, the, and like I was telling you about Germany, you know, like they can attack things. And I showed you on the cards there, okay, so if you attack that guy, sure, you can do that. But, you know, this guy's going to get some money. And this guy over here is going to get some money because of that, right? Uh, like when China gets attacked, then the Americans are going to get some money. And the ANZAC and the FBC are going to get some money. Um, but, uh, the, uh, but the Allies, though, if the Allies want to attack somebody, they got to pay 10 IPP. And I'm talking about a minor power here. So, like, if the Allies wanted to attack Denmark up there, it would cost them 10 bucks to do that. So they got to pay the 10 bucks, then they can go in and attack Denmark. 
Um, and that's because like they had democracies and you know they were nice and they, they had to uh, they were the good guys right they, they couldn't just go in and take out another country that hadn't done anything to them uh, unlike the uh, the Germans and the Italians and the fascist Ita Italians and sorry and the imperialist Japanese like they were they, they were the aggressors in the war so they could uh, they can they can attack anybody they want without that penalty. But when you do that, uh, so any nation that is that is part of the Allies, and what I mean by that is uh, not just um, going to be part of the Allies, but are actually a lot allied at that point. Uh, they're they're at war with a major power. You can divvy that cost up. So like if the British want to attack Denmark, then the Americans could pay. All of it if they want you know or they could pay half of it or French could pay a little bit of it uh, you don't have to pay the whole cost yourself the Allies can divvy that cost up when they're going to attack one of these minor powers so what else I'm looking around um, I think that's about all I have for you today like there's a couple of treaties there's the one and we're, we're gonna talk uh, about the Spanish Civil War uh, in a separate video like I'm going to do a video on um, uh, each of the expansion sets. So I, I'm not going to do another one on like the, what I've told you here. I've already explained everything to do with the Spanish Civil War. I think uh, there might be a little bit more that I could talk about from the out of box game. But as far as uh, the expansion set, we're going to go through each and every expansion set that they have. But that's not going to happen for a while because I want to get through the rules first and then uh, then I will start doing the expansion sets. And that will be a good time for you to take a look at those and you know, think, of, hmm, I wonder if I should get this expansion set. Well, just watch that video. Maybe it's something that you're interested in. Maybe it doesn't fit your game. You know, maybe you and your friends, they, the way they play the game, that's not going to be a good fit for you, right? Because there's a lot of different kind of expansion sets and and they're going to change some of what we talked about here today as well. Um, like for instance in Spain, but there's, they're also going to change some of the other things and it's not worth getting into now. You know, like the, there's one about Argentina, right? And so that's obviously going to change what happens with what I talked about Argentina already. Um, that's where Germany relocates their capital down there. And there's one that has to do with uh, Antarctica down here. Normally Antarctica is a no-go zone, but it could be German. <laughs> it depends, you know, if you're using that expansion set or not. So uh, I think that's pretty much it for this video. Um, I'm not sure what else I can tell you. There's probably a lot that I'm missing, but the thing is about the political situation is that it's located in different parts. Like I was showing you earlier, you know, it, it's in the rules, right? It's in, it's in the regular rules but it's also on these cards. So I'd have to go through every single card. And I, I just, I wanted to give you an example. So I, I showed you the German card and I showed you the American card. Um, and uh, and that's just an example. So you, you'd have to, like this video would, would take forever if, uh, if I went through every one of the cards, it would be like a four hour video <laughs> because there's a lot of cases where this happens or that happens or, you know, Unless this happens first, then that doesn't happen. Uh, unless, you know. <laughs> anyway, that's it for this video on the political situation. So I hope that I didn't confuse you even more. Oh, there's one more thing I could mention. If anybody attacks the Netherlands up there, then the Netherlands down here, and I think they're worth about 10 or 11 bucks. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And there's one down in South America over here. Ten. See, there's one down in South America there. So those ten dollars, the the Commonwealth gets those. So you uh, you would put the British roundels on those, and then you can divvy that up between the Commonwealth any way you want. And it doesn't have to be the same t same every time. Like you could say, okay, this turn uh, Anzac's going to get five, and the UK the FEC is going to get three, and and the UK is going to get two and then next turn it could be different like the UK could get all ten of them right <laughs> of whatever's left like the Japanese might come down here and, and uh, take a lot of that out as well right so you get whatever's left whatever is in possession whatever the Netherlands has the British is going to get 
once that uh, that one um, is gone. And that is also the case in here, like here's the Belgian Congo down here. So when Belgium gets taken out up there, then this is going to become British as well. And I don't know that there's anything else, uh, um, any other colonies, but if there is, like if you take out uh, somebody's home country, and the Netherlands would be a home country there, and Belgium would be the home country, then you also then then the other the the uh, um, their colonies will align to the other side. In this case, it would be Britain, right? So anyway, that's the last. Now I'm gonna go. I gotta go get some lunch. Take care, everyone. General Hangar Nate out.